Again, welcome to this season of Advent. Welcome to this uh, first Sunday in the new Christian year. For the next four Sundays, we are going to be considering um, answers to a question. And the sermon series asks this question, why did Jesus come? And so we're going to look at a different answer to that question each Sunday. Today, we ask the question, why did Jesus come? And the sermon title is the answer to give us hope. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. But I want to say a word about Advent as we enter into this season of Advent. Advent is that season of waiting. It's a season of, of anticipating. It is a season of longing. Advent is, is also the season that's kind of in between. Advent means arrival or coming. And here in this season, we find ourselves between remembering and celebrating the birth of Jesus, his coming, and looking forward and anticipating, longing for, watching for, waiting for his second coming. And so we are here in the midst of this tension between what has already happened that we celebrate, and what has yet to occur, and we anticipate. So season, so the season of Advent puts us in that place of tension in between. And my friends, this is where, like it or not, where we live, kind of in the in-between of the already and the not yet. But we're not the only ones who have lived in this place, in this tension, in this in-between. Christians for two millennia, since the, the birth, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus have, have waited for and anticipated Christ's return. They have prayed for it. Christians have sung about it. We sang about it this morning in our opening songs. Come thou long expected Jesus. O come, O come, Emmanuel. And so we sing with and we pray with Christians for 2,000 years, waiting for the second coming as we remember Christ's birth and his first coming. So that makes us a people in between, but it also makes us a people of hope, of longing, of waiting, of desiring for that which is yet to be. And Advent is a season of hope. So in whom do we place our hope? And what is it that we hope for? Or let me ask you this. Do you hope for anything? Have you given up hoping as just wishful thinking, as a childish endeavor, as a hollow pursuit? Have you given up on hoping? Dare we hope for anything or anyone? Well, maybe we have because sometimes hope is hard. And hope can be hard when you have been disappointed so many times. And we've grown weary, maybe, of hoping. And we are disturbed, discouraged, because nothing seems to change. Nothing seems to come to pass, to fruition, in our hoping. In a sense, that is what we heard from Psalm 42 that Chuck Allen just read, this this. Uh, psalm that was written in between the time of exile before the Jews returned back to Jerusalem waiting for the, for the consummation of the kingdom of a return to home of a seeing the manifestation of the power of God and so the psalmist expresses as the deer longs for, pants for thirsts for the living waters the psalmist is longing for the living God through tears, through pouring out his soul, through worshiping with the throngs, yes, and remembering that time, but looking forward through the watches of the night, saying, my song is still within me. It is a prayer to the God of my life. And the psalmist says, in essence, I say to God, my rock, have you forgotten me? Will you let my enemies gloat over me? And those who watch the psalmist 
wait and pray and hope. Ask the question and taunt. Where's your God now? Where's your God? Has he forgotten? And when we look at all that's going on in the world right now, and where we find ourselves in a place in between and a tension, it seems like the world might be able to say to us, okay, Christians, where's God now? How's this belief in Jesus working for you? I think that we can, we can, we can uh, sympathize, empathize, have compassion with, and join with the psalmist in saying, where are you, God? Have you forgotten me? We look at all that's going on in politics and the fights and the scandals and we look at what's going on in culture and what's bubbling into the light in a positive way but in a troubling way with all these abuses and scandals, mm -hmm. depression of women, objectification, the female, of, of society as a whole with all of the violence and the massacres and innocents being killed both here at home around the globe. We could even look at home and, and see the, the hardships and the disappointments in families and, 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 and the grief and, and the loss that we feel in the, in the death of loved ones and, and, the, and the hardship of disease. And, and, and then put over that a veneer or icing of nuclear threats and it all looks pretty hopeless. And it seems like there is reason to say that our souls are disquieted with the psalmist. Our faces are cast down and it is easy for us to cry out, where are you, God? And so in the face of all of this, it might be understandable that we have possibly lost some enthusiasm for hope, that maybe we've given up on hope. We don't bother to hope. It's too painful, too many disappointments, and we are crushed in spirit. Now, I don't want to make light of all of this, but it has brought back to my mind a time when I was a little boy in Macon, Georgia. And I must have been in the second or third grade, and it's always been a family tradition, and one that we still practice today, that on Christmas Eve you can open one gift. And I really looked forward maybe almost to that gift as much as I did Christmas morning because I knew when I got to open that one gift that Christmas was just around the corner. And I, I very strategically picked out the one gift that I would open before Christmas. And so on this particular Christmas, low those many years ago in Macon, Georgia, uh, I, I picked out the gift that I was going to open and it was from my best friend, Sam McGahee. And this was one of the first times that I had really gone out and bought a gift for somebody else and knew that they were going to be buying a gift for me. And I worked very hard to pick out just the right gift for Sam. And I knew it would be an awesome gift and that he would love it. And I knew that he was my best friend and he was going to do the same for me. That he had spent a lot of time picking out my gift. And that I would be overjoyed at opening it. And so I didn't even want to wait till Christmas morning to open that gift. And so I decided that would be the gift I would open on Christmas Eve. And we had the service at the church. And we came home as a family. And it was time to open up the gift. And I picked up that box. It was about, oh, about four and a half inches tall. And about seven inches wide. And about seven inches long. And it had weight to it. You know when you pick up those gifts and they're light and airy, it's like, ah, this is nothing. This thing had some bulk to it. I knew it was something good, and I hoped and prayed that it was not only uh, some, some football cards, because I was a football card collector. It wasn't just a pack or two of football cards. It was the whole cotton-picking set. You know how you would go to the go to the convenience store and they had that the box that you'd pull out the single little uh, individual wrapper of cards. This was the perfect size of a whole box of football cards, and I just knew that Sam had done it. And I tore into the package when it was my turn, and I was crestfallen. I was 
crushed. It did have weight and bulk to it. But it was a box full of hot chocolate packets. <laughs> now, I like hot chocolate. Don't get me wrong. But I was like, Sam, come on. Hot chocolate? That's like a gift you give to my mother. I was so disappointed. Now, I, say, I tell you this story, again, not to make light of the fact that sometimes our hopes have been crushed, dashed, and all that we had hoped for and prayed for and longed for had not come to pass. And so we just stop. It's too painful. Don't want to go through that again. Do you still allow yourself to hope, to dream, to anticipate, to long for what was, or better yet, to hope for what will be. My hope and my prayer and my confident expectation for the future, my contagious enthusiasm for what to come, for what is to come. Do I still have that? Do I nurture it? Do I know what it is? Do I have the will, the strength to hope even now? Even still, am I able to call up that child in these days and times? You know, children are the epitome of hopefulness, especially at Christmas. They're not going to be disappointed. They won't give up. Caleb was not going to quit until he got that dollar bill out of the back pocket of those tight little jeans. <laughs> Sometimes those jeans can be tight. But it was Jesus who said, unless you turn and become like a child, you will never be fit for the kingdom of heaven. I want us to become like children. I want us to hold on to hope. I want us to be full of hope, which is more than wishful thinking. I want us to be full of that profound trust and confidence in the God of hope. In Psalm 42, the psalmist said, it, 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 toward the end of that psalm, or throughout that psalm, actually repeated, it's almost like the psalmist is giving himself or herself a little pep talk. Talking to his or her own soul. Did you hear that language? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? And the psalmist answers his or her own question and says, Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, my help and my God. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's so powerful. And yes, these are difficult times. Yes, there are hard days. Yes, we suffer. It's what Paul said in his fifth chapter in Romans, <clears throat> knowing that suffering is real, but it produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces what? Hope. We persevere through the suffering to endure to know character, and a character that will shine in hope and not disappoint us. For that's what Paul says. This hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. And Paul goes on to say, while we were weak at the right time, Christ died for us, for the ungodly. That's us. He says, because of this, we have peace with God. 
We know who this God is through Jesus Christ. Through him, Jesus Christ, we have obtained access to this grace, this incredible gift of God's mercy and favor, and that is where we stand. What an incredible gift we have been given. Jesus himself and Jesus will not disappoint us. And so we rejoice in the hope of sharing in the glory of God, Paul says. We rejoice in the hope of sharing the glory of God. For that is the reason for which Jesus came. Not to just give us hope, but hear this, to be our hope. So the sermon title is a little misleading. Why did Jesus come? Yes, to give us hope, but more importantly, to be our hope. And Jesus Christ will not disappoint us. He will never leave us or forsake us. He has redeemed us. We are justified by the shedding of his blood and we are being sanctified, transformed by the power of his spirit at work in us and Jesus will come again. This is the bedrock upon which we stand. This is the simple uh, message of the good news of the gospel. The early church put it into a mantra, put it into a, a song of the church that we have sung through the ages. Christ has died. Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And this is the truth that fuels our life and gives us hope for the living of our days. This is our confident expectation in the future, come what may. This is our contagious enthusiasm for what God has yet to do. This is our sure hope that blessings beyond the telling are on the way. And this is Paul's prayer for us. This is Paul's prayer for the Christians in Rome. We read it from the end of his letter. From the 15th chapter, the 13th verse. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope, in Jesus Christ, who is our hope. Not in political ideologies or political parties, not, not in, in human beings or, or the efforts of, 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 of humans, not in sports teams. I had to put that in there. Not in the stock market. but in the God who loves us and gave himself for us. We of all people are the hopeful ones. It is our job to abound in hope and to share that hope. When I think of hope, I think also of David Bailey, <coughs> a man who had a profound influence upon my life a man that I met a year and a half after his diagnosis with a grade 4 glioblastoma who had been told he would live six months. Already he was a year beyond his death date. And he lived 13 more years of incredible witness to a hope and a joy in Jesus Christ. He wrote songs. He performed them all over the country and in several foreign countries. He was a lover of life. He was a disciple of Jesus Christ. His music still feeds my soul. One of the songs that he wrote was entitled Share Hope. Listen to some of these lyrics. Everybody has a different burden. Could be a weight upon your shoulder or a storm inside your head. Everybody's lost a precious angel. Mother, father, brother, daughter, or someone else instead. Everybody's trying to find the reason, thinking it will help them learn to cope. But the only way anyone gets stronger 
is when they learn to share, share hope. Hope is not a fragile emotion. It's not a candle burning softly in the night. It's more like a blazing bonfire, shattering the darkness with its light. Hope is not a sweet and subtle feeling. It's not a whisper trying to find a voice. It's more like a deep, resounding chorus. Anyone can sing, but you've got to make a choice. Sometimes it takes a little courage. It ain't easy climbing up that slippery slope. But when you finally do and discover that it's true, you want to share, share hope. It is that hope in Jesus Christ that will not disappoint us. It's the hope that will not disappoint you. No matter where you are, no matter what you are going through or what you have been through, no matter how long you have hoped or waited, no matter how tired, discouraged, disappointed, Take heart, my brothers and sisters, for we can sing with the psalmist. Hope in God, for God is with you. For yet shall we again praise him, for Christ died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. For God is our help. He is with us now. And he will be with us until he comes again in all of his glory. And he will come again. Amen, amen. and amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father God, we humbly pray that by the grace and the gift of your Holy Spirit that we would know your hope and that we would turn to you like expectant, joyful children knowing that in you we are not disappointed that we may know afresh in this advent season your joy and your hope and that we might share it with the world for your glory and for christ's sake and let all god's children say amen, amen.